morning and welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, and disembodied hands, Justin and Quindy. How are you all today? And my throat is tickling, so I may have to run again an allergy pill. Maybe. Let's see. I'd like to adjust. There, I'm adjusting. Tolerable Tuesday. Yes, yes, yes. I think I slept well, so I think it's an okay day. I think it's a good day. Trying to, like, tell myself it's a good day. Even if it's only a tolerable Tuesday. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yes. We're doing things. We're doing things and stuff. <clears throat> but yeah, if I get a frog in my throat, I'll run and take a Benadryl real quick. Uh, but I also have the, the lawnmower. I can hear it in the distance. It's stalking us. So if it gets close enough, I'll just, throw, I'll just close the window. Alrighty. So we got a Lizette. What do you guys want to do today? Like, we could... We could finish up the front of the sword and do some leather and some wood. How about that? Do you guys like that idea? Or or we could work on the yellow on the back. And um, we're going to eventually put a freehand in here. Which one? Front or back? Front or back. I'm making you all choose this early. I'm making it you all choose. I'm personally inclined to do the front, but... Good kitty. Good kitty. Darkish red. What would be a neat color to use on the membranes? Um, when I do darkish red, I tend to like go blue-black for membranes, Cybstorm, but you could also mix some uh, skin color into your red to get a lighter, fleshier reddish color and do that. Up, oh, everybody's like, whatever our master wants. Yes, I see that. It's like back front, back front, back front, back front. I'm just going to do NMM. <laughs> no, we'll do leather. Let's do leather. Let's do the leather. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Hmm. Now we have a question. We, will we go reddish with our leather? Maybe we should go kind of a muted red with our leather. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I could go. Let's see. Let's look at some leather colors here. Hmm, I could go. I play with with uh, oxide brown. I could go. Well, yeah, I could go nut brown with this. Um, let's see here. The traditional color to use would be ruddy leather because it would really pick up the greens. But we've been avoiding that, so I think I'm gonna put that one back. Where is my saddle? There it is. Saddle brown. Also kind of a reddish leather, but it's a little more muted, so I feel a little better about that one. Well, ruddy leather is going to look good on this just because it's green. Just because the model is green. Ruddy leather is the, is the leather color you should normally reach for if you're looking to intensify your colors. You don't have any other red on the model, but you still want to offset that green. However, hey, Nalinda. Thank you for the raid. Dang. Nice raid. Thank you so much. Dang. Hi, everybody. I'm Ann. I work for Reaper Miniatures and have for the last 18 years, which should be either impressive or depressing. <laughs> no, no, it's impressive because Reaper's awesome or I wouldn't have worked for them for that long. Anyway, I made the Master Series paint line and these days I live out on the West Coast, but I still stream on Reaper every morning to uh, show you how to use Reaper Master Series paint and paint Reaper models and answer a lot of questions and talk about a lot of random things in the chat because it's Twitch. Hello, everybody. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Wow, look at all that enthusiasm. You guys have too much energy. It's still early out here. <laughs> well, okay, early. You know, it's before 10. It's before 10. And I claim to be a morning person. Look at me. I'm just ridiculous. Obviously, I needed more caffeine. Where's my crawly hamster yelling coffee? All right, so we're trying to decide, guys, on um, on leather colors. She doesn't have much leather on, it, on her. Let me get her closer to the camera. There we go. Yeah, 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 it's late where you are, exactly. So this is Liz Zett, and she is the first um, Bones USA model that we've been working on here on the stream. She's a classic Reaper model. This is a re-sculpt of a very, very classic Werner Clock um, Warlord model, actually, um, patterned after the same concept art by Izzy Collier. But, uh, well, thank you. Yeah, the freehand is fun. I mean, it was, uh, 
Doing little vines and leaves, guys, is one of the easiest things you can possibly do for freehand. It lets you be completely random. You don't have to space out anything. You just keep doing little vines and leaves and making them fit the space. And as long as you, like, are fairly even about it and you don't get too clumpy in one area and too loose in another area, like, it'll look great no matter what level you're at. Uh, so, yeah, vines and leaves for the win, really. Oh, the painted books thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked that one, actually. I thought it turned out well. Thank you, Nalinda. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah, we're working on our Originally, this was a project to work on yellow, and we decided to kind of go greenish with the yellow, and then before we knew it, she was a wood elf. Um, so now we're kind of... Today we're going to work more on finishing the front, but then tomorrow... Or, I'm sorry, the next... Next time we work on her, because we have a six-model rotation, and we go through one at a time. Um, but six days from now, we'll probably work on cleaning up the yellow back here and uh, putting freehand down on the hem back here. So... But yeah, we wanted to decide to go darker with the skin. We decided to go like, you know, greenish yellow instead of most people go orangey with their yellows. So otherwise, I really like uh, how she's turned out. And I'm trying very hard to stay away from complementary colors. Although I did go with a purple in the, in the yellow, but it is not like a straight up like reddish purple, which would have been the true complement. So, you know, but yes. Yeah, Lizette, the, well, she's been painted in so many different ways, and she's been painted by great painters. So, I mean, Jennifer Haley has painted her, and, you know, Derek Schubert, who's another one of our, before he turned to sculpting, turned to the dark side, uh, he also was a great painter, uh, still is a great painter. And uh, so I wanted to go very different from all of the versions I've seen, like both Derek versions and the Jen version, um, and stuff like that. So that's why we went so dark with her skin. And, uh, at that point it seemed really logical to kind of go maybe wood elf with her, uh, given the color choices. So, so yeah, so the runes on the sword are blocked in here just because they are originally, they are eventually going to go, um, gold. We tried to do them in a color. It just didn't work given our color scheme. So I was just like, yeah. So yeah, we're slowly at this point, she is almost done. I mean, she has eyes and everything. So, um, we're just figuring out leather, wood, we're doing a little bit more NMM, and then it'll just kind of be touch-ups. It's going to be, uh, and, and freehand, like I said, finishing out the yellow on the back here. I want to accentuate these folds a bit more, um, and, uh, getting in there with, uh, actually if I pull the palette in it usually, yeah, there we go. So we do have some shadows on this yellow. It's a very pale color, so sometimes it needs some white in the frame for the camera. Good as my camera is, um. But yeah, so we're going to accentuate this a little bit, smooth it out a little bit, and then do probably green vine freehand along the bottom hem, maybe with a flower or two if I feel like it. But the flowers are not going to, if we do flowers like we did up front here, they aren't going to look as uh, as good on the back side here unless we make them a dark purple because of contrast, right? We went darker green with this interior liner on the dress for a reason so that everything would stand out when we started doing freehand. Doing dark freehand on a light surface, we would have to go much darker with the flower to make it stand out. And by going darker with it, we would probably lose a lot of that purple color. So it's kind of that back and forth, that question of whether we really want to do that. I may just do leaves. I thought about kind of doing a uh, kind of more of a Celtic tree design, but I don't think I've got it quite enough room for it because it bunches up so much toward the top. There's my Crowley hamster. I needed you, Crowley, to yell coffee at me <laughs> a few minutes back. Like, because you yelling coffee, like, it just makes me, like, perk up just a little bit as if the coffee is entering my veins, like, through osmosis digitally. I don't know. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. I'm just a little bit, and it's not even that I didn't get good sleep last night. I got great sleep, but it's like, you know, when you get good sleep and then you're sluggish in the morning until a certain point, and then you're like, eee! but yeah, I'm like that right now. I haven't reached the eee point yet. Well, yeah, what do like a, a block of green, Pendrake? I don't know. I mean, you could do that, but I really like the yellow. I mean, I could, I could, but hmm. I mean, it's an option. It is an option. I kind of had my heart set on doing, like, the opposite, though. Um, I mean, so the, the answer is, like, like you could do that. It's totally totally an option to create an art, artificially create with paint um, a, a dark hem on the dress. 
Uh, but I kind of like the yellow. I kind of like the yellow. I kind of want to do just a freeform embroidery on it. Because it's not like, I, mean, I guess you could argue that she has cuffs that we did in a different color. So you could argue that a hem on the dress makes, uh, that ma it makes sense. Although then when you do that dark hem, it's going to go up against the scabbard here. So you, you're going to have to figure out a way to differentiate them because they're going to run into each other. Oh, that's what I was going to do, Pendrick. I was going to do a dark green. I was just talking about purple flowers because here we did vines with a flower. And I wouldn't probably go purple flower back here. I would just do vines. I thought about a tree design just because I thought about bringing it up in the center because that would be good composition. But then there's too much bunching up here. But the original plan was to put a vine design on the bottom of the, the hem. Did you not? You might not have gotten that. That was originally the, that was originally the concept. Yeah, my original concept was just to do leaves. I don't think it's the green thread from the other side coming through. I think it's just embroidery. Like, whenever you put a color over another color, you, you're going to suggest kind of that it's embroidered or sewn in. So, yeah. My original plan was just to put a vi vines as a border down here. Not to do a hem. I got confused with the way that Pendrake said, Pendrake said it, and he didn't mean that at all. So... But no, that was the original thing. I just mentioned the tree and the flower in passing because these are things that you think about. Um, and you could repeat the purple down there. But I'm not, I just don't know. Unless you did a very large purple flower in the center with vines going out, which you could. Um, if you did a large flower, you could get this purple and drag it down there. You know. But we do have enough purple, really, up and around. We've got the back, at, back part of the crystal. We've got the hem. We, we, or sorry, we've got the hilt. We've got these... Uh, rolls and we've got the staff wrap so ah. ripples 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 is better yeah yeah definitely alrighty cool I just noticed I got blue stuff blue tack totally smeared down the side of my cap which is one of the sad things about these caps but we can use um putty to get it back all right so let's just actually do something because we're talking a lot I am not going to go with ruddy leather because it's too predictable. So I have to decide which of these I like better. I think I like that one better. That one's still a little bit reddish, but it's a little more muted, so it's not going to be as in our face. And actually, I've discovered a liking for saddle brown. I never used to like it. Like, I was always like, really? But over time, it has grown on me. So let us get some of that. And we actually want to get our walnut out as well, or our black and brown. Which one did I use? I must look closely at it to determine. I believe... Hmm. I believe walnut. But you know what? I could totally still use black and brown instead. Because I am highlighting it. Yeah. So I like to use colors on here that we don't always use. And ruddy leather is one that I always recommend for a bunch of stuff. So we'll switch it up a little today. Yeah, maybe I did use black and brown on this. I'm going to mix uh, mix up a puddle of black and brown with a bit of the saddle brown in it. And because black and brown is so very potent with its base, I'm going to actually go more like a fortitude saddle to blackened and then uh, we'll see how that looks you can usually I mean anything like russet brown or, or black and brown those are usually um, pretty neutral darks that you can use to mix in to darken any other leathery brown oh that's kind of a nice color it's still pretty dark you guys can't see how light it is because of all this white but um Mm -hmm. You can kind of see it. It's kind of a pleasant, uh, unobject what I call unobjectionable neutral dark. I'm going to actually pop in two more drops to make it six to one or six to two to lighten it up just a little bit more. But the reason that it's taking so much of the saddle brown to knock back this uh, black and brown is just that it's the black and brown has uh, 
a lot of high solids pigment. It's got a very high pigment load, and so it is uh, making it more difficult. And I'm mixing, I'm taking my mixing brush without rinsing it out, and I'm mixing it into this saddle brown. Thus, I'm bringing a little bit of the black and brown into the saddle brown, making them a little bit more compatible. It's a nice neutral, and it's got that slight reddish hint to it, Big Apple, so... And it's kind of a, a good medium leather when you don't want to go orangey or yellowy. Like you want to keep it kind of muted and kind of red and you don't want it to be too distracting. So yeah. I mean, I knew people who loved the color in Vallejo, which is very similar to the color that we have. Um, and I just wasn't into it at that point because I was doing stuff that was uh, generally a lot more um, high chroma. It's more saturation, more, more intense color. All right, let's try this and see if we like it. I'm going to start with laying down a layer of this, which may not be light enough to really impact on these d small surfaces, but, well, no, it's a good starting highlight, I think. You can kind of see it. I'm going to back this out of here so you guys can see it. It'll pick up the highlights a lot better if we get that big white thing out of the frame. I'm going to start just by using this dark to try to bring up some of these details. Um, so there are folds in this bag and there's, you know, a front flap on the bag. So I'm trying to keep some of my dark color. And this is just the first step to essentially take this color up. So you can kind of see how adding this is bringing up just a suggestion of differentiation. You can see definitely on that rim that it is a lighter color, but it's close to, it's really close to the black and brown that we started with. So it's not showing up hugely, but that's not a bad deal. When you are layering, you don't want a, a huge, uh, you don't want to be able to see the huge partition right off the bat, right? You want to kind of blend it up. So for me right now, I don't want, a, I don't want to see brush strokes necessarily. I want, oh, that's going way too light there. Wrong color, Anne. So I want something that's going to come up slowly so that I can layer it. That means that you want to be able to see the difference like we do, but you don't want to be able to see it like, oh my gosh, there's a big difference between those two colors. You want to kind of be able to visually blend it. And I'm not going to highlight the bottom of the bag because it's not really upturned at all. If you could see the bottom, you, you have a case for like putting one highlight here. I guess we can put one little highlight there on the bottom of the bag because there is always reflected light. This is why you don't just leave things just flat out dark. It's why I disagree with the leave it black um, school of thought if it's on the underside of things. Unless you're doing a really dramatic like really dramatic light source like you've got a really intense light source coming from above then I could maybe see it but even then there's reflected light I mean it's a style right if you're doing realism then you worry about reflected light if you're doing comic book you really don't so depending on your visual um, aesthetic which you prefer I I do like realism I will I always wanted to be kind of a photorealistic artist, and I realized early that my style was too comic booky for that. It would take a lot of effort for me to uh, to retool it, and then I realized I didn't really want to in the first place. Um, but in painting, in mini painting, I do like to reach for more realistic. So you can see just a little bit. See a little bit of highlight there? That's what you want to start with when you're layering. You want to be able to see the first layer just a bit. Um, and especially on small surfaces like this, then you can just build up your next layer on top of your previous one and everything will start, you know, coming together and looking blended, even though you didn't really blend. It's just that you took small steps toward the blend. So visually it's going to like the eye is going to blend it together. And here on her hip bone, where there's a bit of a place where the light would probably catch the whole belt, I'm going to just put this in top to bottom, not leave that. You can see where I'm leaving kind of a dark and highlighting the edges, and that's because that's how belts wear. But here, I think, um, where her hip bulges out, it would actually hit the light. So I'm going to go for that highlight there. Yeah, clear magenta. 
Well, yeah, but it's, we don't actually, do we? No, we we don't have a neon triad. I mean, punk rock pink, neon yellow, and LED blue are fairly saturated colors, but nothing is going to be as bright as the clear brights. And if you want um, that magenta to read brighter, just add a tiny touch of white to it, and it'll read uh, really, really bright. But punk rock pink is a little bit less cold than the magenta, it uses a mixture of warm and cold reds, so depends on what you're going for. I didn't really have the capacity to do something like a neon blue, so I just went for a fairly intense blue. All right, let's get the boot. What's it a boot? So. You can do just a little bit of leather weathering at this scale. Uh, and what you usually want to look at is where, where do things get weathered? When you're doing weathering, you always want to ask yourself, you know, where would this actually wear off? On boots, it's usually the toe that scuffs, sometimes uh, along the sides that are toward the earth. We get this, these little wrinkles. 3D sculpting enables tiny little details that can be hard to paint. And around along belts and stuff, it's the edges. So when we do a little weathering along her belt here, we're going to be hitting probably a little bit of a stipple pattern along the edges. And that's really all the highlighting, like all the weathering you can do on 28 millimeter models. Like... Weathering is easy to get into at this scale because you don't have to be perfect or precise with it. It tends to be very simplified because everything on the model is, you know, so small. I mean, there were some sculptors that could do these tiny details in putty. Tom Meyer comes to mind. He still can. Um... But it was not every sculptor could. And 3D printing definitely, or 3D sculpting definitely enables people to get the fine detail. The, the learning curve there is just learning how deep to make it or how shallow, how it's going to translate. Um, if you aren't just printing it, but you're trying to mass produce it in plastic or metal. All right. And then as we get toward the back of her leg, uh, I'm going to actually... I might put one highlight back there. And I also, I see I missed a spot way, way back there. So I need to grab some of my dark and uh, put that back there. Um, along the belt, uh, it's absolutely going to be highlighted. Like the top edge of the belt here is usually where you put highlights, uh, Sephiroko. And you would, you would put a highlight there, but you would also add texture there for weathering. Um, belts tend to crack across. You can do that, but at 28 millimeter, I find that it's just not practical. I mean, you, you could, but it's hard to, it's hard to get the viewer to understand what you're doing when you're trying to do that, uh, at 28 millimeter. That's why I say that, yeah, it's all texture. I mean, cracked leather, weathering is just texture. You use the same tools, same brush strokes, just different colors. Depends on what you're doing. But, but we'll absolutely like add wear on the edges of the belt. We could even add a little wear on some of the edges of the bag. Um, but, uh, I mean, you're highlighting with a different color than you're doing that texture with. Cause usually leather is going to crack and be a, like a light beige. So if you're going to suggest cracks, you almost have to go up to that. Or if the cracks are just too fine, like at this range, at this scale, you probably wouldn't actually see that. You just have the light like picking up that there were cracks. Then you'd just do a stipple pattern with our saddle brown or something a little bit up from it. I may mix some um, leather brown into this to get a final highlight to suggest that. It's always a big fat question mark. How much? You know what? I'm going to actually go with walnut for the shadow behind that boot. Um... Yeah, weathering is just texture. Because you're trying to bring out the texture of cracks in leather, or you're trying to bring out the texture of mud on a cloak, you know, or 
you're trying to, the only time it isn't texture is when you're fading, when you're doing faded cloth or ground in dirt. Then you're shading and highlighting with different colors. So when you're doing something that's so integral to the cloth that it's stay, like essentially a stain on the cloth or ground into the cloth, that's when you don't, you're no longer working with texture. But when you're working with anything else that, that would create a texture, then that's what you're doing. I mean, giants are great for that. Some of the giants, because they have nice big th straps and shoulder pads that you could do like leather cracks on, which is, I think, uh, I did that actually a long, long time ago, back when we were still doing uh, the old uh, toolbox live. I did a shoulder pad for a giant. I might still have it. I mean, I'm sure it's out there on the Reaper YouTube, it's just I have no idea how to find it. Let me see. One second. I'm going to check because I can try to find it fast. And if I can't find it fast, because I can go by dates, and it would be before I moved, so it would be 2019... I did look up, actually, what I did find real quick is a bunch of cracked leather belts. So what leather tends to do is it does this. And you can see that if you shrunk this down to the size of a 28 millimeter, you'd never see it. Like, it's real subtle texture, right? That's actually a belt. But that's how belts wear. I'm just going to glance through, see if I can find... I was saving a lot of leather pictures around this time because I was going to teach it. And if I can't find this quickly, then we will just let it go. I think I know it's in 2019. It's just the question is where. And almost through. I can't find it soon, then I'm just going to give up. But I do have a picture of that shoulder pad that I did on the giant. Yeah. I have a lot of sword pictures. That's not helpful, though. Yeah, I'm not finding it. All right. Well, that's that's too bad because I did have it. I suppose with a little bit of time I could find it. I was just hoping to cut out the uh, you guys having to search through ancient Reaper uh, pro trips pro, ti pro tips um, episodes trying to find it. Although it might be called leather, and if it is, then Quindy can find it. Um, yeah, it's like way back in the old, uh, the old toolbox, Quindy, so it's not even, I know I'm close too, um, but yeah, it's old, back in the old toolbox, I did a leather shoulder pad on a giant, and uh, I really was hoping I could find it, but sometimes I've got a good grasp of where I am on these, and sometimes I'm not. Yeah, I don't know. All I've got is a bunch of wolf pictures. It's all I've got. It's all I have to to show for myself. A bunch of dog pictures, but you know, you guys don't need to see those. Yeah, a bunch of glass pictures. This is annoying. Oh well. Quindy will find it because she's magical. And I know that it's not back that far, so we're gonna stop there. Alright. Resume. I just thought it was uh, more in like 2019 and I think it might be actually 2018. So, you know, time, it flies. Like what has happened to these years? Actually, a lot has happened in those years. I can't really say that nothing happened in those years. Yeah.
Sorry to make you go spelunking, Quindy. I really thought I could find that picture. But I had entirely the wrong uh, time frame. So I'm just taking some walnut, guys, and smooshing it back in that crack so it darkens down. I had a little bit of the... Um, it's hard to prime behind a boot. So essentially, sometimes you're going to get these hollows, these little shallow hollows that are going to need help. So I just blocked in some walnut back there behind the leg. back out a bit. Boom. There we are. Yeah, I think we're pretty good there. There are a couple of studs that we need to hit on her boot. We're not going to worry about those right now. And we'll put a little bit there. A little bit of a highlight on the side of the boot. Yeah, lots of doggo photos. Lots of photos from dog shows, in fact, with Kiri's, uh, Kiri's uh, grandchildren in them. Alright, so let's do a little bit more of a highlight with our regular leather, and then I'm going to bring in a bit of, um, like, leather brown into this uh, saddle brown. But first we'll do a highlight with the saddle. <laughs> Bye, crows. Thanks for coming. Yeah, the interwebs. They're having a day. I was hoping I'd just find my picture because honestly, it's much faster to just sew the finished shot. All right, and we've got a little leather topper. And I'm pretty much just trying to hit these folds and wrinkles. So you can see how those, how highlighting just that one step brings that bottom, that, that part of the boot out so much more than up on the leg. See the big difference that that one highlight makes. But having that first highlight in there is necessary uh, in order to get that effect, like you, to get it to look good and not just like you plopped one color down on top of another. So now I'll turn it so the light hits it a little bit. I'm going to grab this upper edge and this little bottom edge here because those parts would stick out a little bit. I'm going to leave that other area with only its first highlight on it. And I'm probably going to leave, I'll bring the highlight back a little bit, but I'm mostly going to, the second highlight is mostly going to be for the front of the boot because the side and back of the boot are buried in shadow. And so you don't have to spend a lot of time highlighting those. I think I will highlight, I can see where the sole of the boot is. I think I'm going to get in there and highlight that. then that can, uh, I can see that a little bit. All right, that's not bad. And again, we've got a shadow falling on this side of the foot too, so we don't need a lot of work in there. Let's come up here and start to suggest that the edge of this is a little bit uneven, and that we would do with stippling. We'll start with stippling in our uh, saddle leather, saddle brown. And you need a pretty good tip on your brush to get the fine dots that you need to suggest that. So if you try this with something like a Taclon, you may get frustrated. You need a, you need a good brush with a good tip. And the better brush or the better tip you have, the more success, the less frustration you'll have with this sort of thing. Of course, part of it is also brush control. So it's not like a brush will magically change everything, but it will enable you a bit in a good way. It, brushes only enable you in a good way. I am going to bring in a darker shadow on the top here, though. I lost some of my lining. And I want a demarcation between the top of that belt 
and the corset. So I want to bring in a slightly darker shadow here. Because sometimes when you bring in a highlight, you accidentally knock out your lining. And so then you have to come back. You want that lining on 28s or if you don't have a if you don't have a huge uh, contrast, you really want that lining. Like if I was working with a black green next to this yellow or something, that would be enough contrast that I wouldn't need the line. One good example is the hand here up against the staff. The staff is so dark, you don't need lining. It's just, you know, it makes a nice differentiator um, by itself, although you do need the line between the fingers. Should be it. Thanks, Quindy. She who has the time to go where I cannot. Let's see if I can get this. There's a lot of detail in this area. And so it's hard to make any subtle texture stand out. That's another thing that's hard to do when you're trying to texture at 28 on a small model. Is that it tends to be so small and there's so much else going on that you just lose it. It just looks like a highlight. That's why I encourage people these days to work on bigger models in addition to little ones. So you can play with these tools uh, and have a better chance of more success with them. Even though it's difficult to make them look good on a big surface, it's also a lot easier to, to do them on a big surface. So it's kind of a trade-off. So I did a little bit of highlighting, stippling along the top of these, and I'm going to get the side of this. But yeah, it's so small that it's very hard to make it read as a texture. I am going to make a mixture of this and leather brown and try to bring in some very stark little weathered bits and see if those work a little better. But until then, we're just going to highlight the edges of things here and get this moving right along. But yeah, the second layer of highlighting is usually when you start to see a lot of uh, nice uh, details pop out. Three layers is like gaming level is what I consider it. A lot of people will just stop here. They'll be like, "Ooh, it looks good," and they'll stop. And this is why this is where the uh, slogan of our old mini painting club, which was you know to highlight it till you think it looks good, and then put two more highlights on it. That's where that uh, slogan came from. From the tendency of people to like have like three colors on it and then say oh that looks great I'm done when actually their stuff could look even better if they kept going all right get a little highlight in here let's get out that little little pouchy thing we could use the same color with the wood if we wanted to. Um, or we could go different with the wood. It's really, at that point, it's your call. For the sake of efficiency, I tend to do them similarly. Although I may jump straight up to saddle on this if I want to do like a wood grain. But wood grain is also problematic at this scale. It wouldn't, you wouldn't see it. But a lot of people like to suggest it anyway, just because otherwise the staff will look really plain. This one you don't really need to, considering that it's got a lot of decorative stuff on the staff. But if you want to, the answer is just to stre make streaky highlights. And if you're going to do streaky highlights, you probably do want to start with the darker color to start creating that illusion. I'm not even going to like leave a lot of uh, differentiation. I'm really only going to put a couple layers probably and uh, I'll leave like one area where you can see the dark through it. So let's see. So we've got, see that dark streak down the middle? I'm going to accentuate that. I'm going to choose to say that that's a very um, pronounced grain in this piece of wood. 
And then having that there will suggest wood grain. Even if the rest of it does not have quite so pronounced a grain. So it gives you that little bit of texture. A lot of people really liked doing wood grain on 28 mil and on shields it can work just fine because you're using at that point your wood grain is actually more like depicting the individual boards that are making up your shield um the individual wooden boards but here and i always find it much easier guys to start really really with a dark background on wood grain and work it up so whatever your shadow color is for your wood grain start with that and then just do lines and leave a bit of that dark between them and then highlight those lines. Ta-da, you're done. But yeah, otherwise I tend to think that wood grain at 28 is it's not what I usually do. It's not something that I like, but... A lot of people do, so we'll do that again. I did several dabs just going around the staff. When we get up to the top here, though, I'm going to actually highlight what's there instead of worrying about grain. That's another reason not to go wood grain on this staff so much is when you get to the top here, you're not going to be doing wood grain because it's got carving. So, But if you did do wood grain down below, technically you should do wood grain up above, right? So you are kind of should choose, but... On this one, this is a teaching model, so if we're not consistent, we're not consistent. I'm getting that color. So that's very subtle so far, but now we're bringing our second highlight. Remember, your first highlight should always be subtle, and your second highlight gives you a lot more pop. All right, so let's bring in these lines where I left a little bit of dark between them, just like I did down below. I usually leave dark. You need to leave some lining between the grain. So I kind of make the grain disappear as it goes near these uh, brass or gold fixtures because... That's probably where dirt would have gathered and where the wood would be stained anyway. Especially if she's holding it up there a lot. There's going to be sweat running down and uh, the oils will trap wood, or trap, sorry, dirt near the brass here. Think about why things would be weathered before you weathered them and where they will be weathered. So just highlighting up here then. And we've got a bit of texture. We don't want a lot. We don't need a lot. The wood, the wood of a staff or a spear or even a bow, unless you're using it as a color accent, it's usually just kind of there. And I tend to use dark browns to, because uh, I like them as grounding colors, like Dark browns work with everything else harmoniously on a model. Um, they clash with almost nothing. Like, I can't think of anything they clash with, unless it's a really weird other brown. But even then, even then it's going to be fine. Um, dark browns just go with everything. And so when I'm picking a color where I've already got a lot of beautiful colors on the model, I don't really want to add another color for wood. Um, I go more subtle. And if you start with the black and brown base, even though the wood you're using or the color you're using is reddish, it'll still read like a nice neutral dark brown. So that's why I'm going this way with it. I also want darks, right? Because I've got a lot of light and medium on this model right now. Um, so keeping the shadow color, starting dark colors with the wood and the leather helps make those real darks on the model. It helps introduce contrast and it also helps those details to stand out more. 
So let's do the back. Got straps on the back. Which I need to line around because they got a bit light in their past uh, painting session. And once I um, once I settle on a leather color, guys, I tend not to switch it up unless there's a reason. If it's the overburdened henchman or something like that, where you know that the, he's going to have a lot of different stuff from a lot of different uh, adventurers or just a very very um, costume conscious, um, you know, paladin, then uh, you could you know experiment with a lot of different leather colors. But other than pack animals or pack people. Um, Unless there's a reason, or treasure piles is another good one. I stick to one color of leather on a model. Mostly because I don't want to... Leather is like... Straps and stuff are the least important part of your mini. And so... Wasting a lot of time trying to figure out colors for those. Just because you're like, oh, it shouldn't all be the same color. When actually... I mean, I don't know about you, but when I created my Ren Faire costume... I was very conscious that I wanted my leather to all be the same color, so you can't tell me that medieval humans, if given the opportunity, I mean, adventurers are rich people. Adventurers are rich people, <laughs> at least once they're past, like, first level. But in their worlds, adventurers have lots of money, and so why not match, you know? Why not look cool? I mean, in a world where mismatching is probably a sign of poverty, um, I could see adventurers matching. So I guess I'm rationalizing, but uh, that's why that's yet another reason. Mostly I've probably efficiency and laziness on my part, but also that I do like to unify everything. So yeah, exactly. Nomad Zeke. But I mean, that's why they become adventurers, right? It's like, you gamble your life, and if you manage to survive, I mean, that's why you have all those NPCs that are just a level five something, right? And then they quit because they were smart. <laughs> They're like, all right, I have enough money to like go and buy a palatial house in my old town and, uh, you know, help my parents in their old age. I'm retiring at level five. You crazy people can keep on going, but I know how dangerous this is. Yeah, I don't, Lord Nobody. I like I like having unified colors, unless unless the exam the um uh the exception would be if the pouch is meant to be a color accent. Like if I need the pouch to be like if, like I did with these little uh, scroll cases. If I need it to be a color accent, then then I'll definitely differentiate it. But often I don't. Often I'll pick a scabbard instead, um, because scabbards were often decorated, right? And so were pouches. It's up to you. But I'm more thinking about the people, the newer painters at my paint club back at Reaper, who would be like, but but I need, I have like three pouches and I have to go a different color with each one, right? And it's like, no, no, you don't. <laughs> you really, really don't. Yeah, pretty much, Nomad Zeke. Pretty much. That's what I think about. Like, that's why you get those adventurers. Like, they never really go into it in D&D, &D, right? They never really talk about why you run into, you know, like people like who are in important positions in the smaller towns who are like level five or six or four, right? You just assume it's because, well, this adventure is level five or six or four. But actually, those are the smart people who got out of adventuring when they had enough money to pay for what they wanted for the rest of their lives. <laughs> If they're the version, they're the, um, the D&D &D version of, uh, of fire, of, uh, financial independence, retire early. Yeah, they're the smart people. Like, I bet, I bet if we were honest, we would have to give those NPCs, all of the NPCs that, like, quit before level 10, uh, I think we have to give all those NPCs an extra point of intelligence and wisdom. <laughs> or at least wisdom. Common sense, right? Because that would be it.
Yes, if they overlap, you can certainly uh, paint them different. However, these overlap and I've chosen not to. And the reason for that is that I'm certain I can make them stand out with highlights. So you don't feel like, don't feel like you have to do that if things overlap. Yes, it will make it easier to make them look different. But you could also do that if you've got a dark leather like this one. You can just take your shadow very dark up against that where those two pieces overlap and make your highlight lighter and it will be fine. So do it if it makes sense with your color scheme and your idea of the model. But don't think you have to do it, I guess is my point. Don't think you must. I try to avoid overlapping stuff in many ways. Like if I'm, if I'm working with two different surfaces, especially. So if I'm working with fabric trim and it's dark green and uh, the scabbard here is dark green, those are two different surfaces, two different materials. And so I'm loath to make them the same color up against each other. But when I'm working with leather on leather, I'm less inclined to try to differentiate them because it's more work. And then I have to make sure that I'm choosing another color that works with the color scheme, especially toward the end where everything is blocked in. We've already got three strong model, uh, three strong colors on the model, not counting the NMM gold, which technically also counts as yellow. Um, so yeah. Oh, there's softy DMs out there. Come on, Thormel. They are totally softy DMs. Yeah, pretty much. Or the one who's painting it for themselves likes it. Yep. Oof. Something is whistling out there, and it's very annoying. Um, but yeah, there's never any. I mean, you know. You, you have heard me say this many times before. There is no one true right way but i like to talk about all of your options because like i said i've had so many beginning painters and intermediate painters even come up to me with the, the idea that they must do something one way they must have you know three different colors of leather for their model because there are three different leather things on it you know so Yeah, I mean, sure. I don't like to think of it that way. I mean, paying for it. Yeah, I'm investing a certain portion of my energy, supplies, and time. But if I try to think of it like that, I will lose the urge to do it. So I need to, for me to be happy, if I'm painting for myself, it becomes leisure and there is no payment like not any more than there would be payment i don't consider like time i spend playing computer games with david to be yes i suppose it's debited for my time time sheet but i try not to think like that that way lies insanity for me ah <laughs> uh. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm very much uh, in the... I, I, when I run, I want to create a cool story. I want to have the players have cool characters and create a cool story in a cool setting. And I try to make it challenging. And if it's not, like, as deadly as it could be, because often I'm a little bit leery of going too far, um, then at least my players have fun with the cool encounters and interesting storylines. So... I am not a killer DM. I tend to err on the other side and then get set, get uh, frustrated with myself that I could have pushed the party more. But, uh, but at the same time, like that's a fine line. And I never want, I never want a total party wipeout because that's the opposite of why I'm running the game. I want to create a cool story. I don't want to end it early. So it has happened that I've killed people. But, uh, in general, I try to not have that happen just randomly. Yeah, I know, right, Thormel? They're pretty much just using... Sometimes people are just using the character for their, uh, for their own, like, you know... Let's see what I can get away with. You know, whatever. All right, let's mix a highlight color for this. Oh, I do need to do the wood on the back of the staff, though. I forgot. 
Uh, and it's almost stretch time. Yeah, no mad Zeke. Sometimes you get those players. I don't have a lot of sympathy for players who try to push the envelope at the expense of other players' characters. Like, I'm, I'm not a big fan of non-team players in my games, and people who play with that style um, tend to get uninvited from my games. Because as a player, I hated those people. So as a GM, I do not encourage those people. If the players are still having fun, then we're okay. But the minute the players stop, the other players stop having fun, then it's not so good. I can see why you're called Open Death Squad then. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, having a GM who's not afraid to kill people can create a really suspenseful, cool game, right? Because you just are never sure as a player. You're like, you have to play it really safe. But then I find, I don't know, maybe it's just my groups, but I tend to have players that are ultra cautious in my groups. So if I went that, st that strategy with them, the game would just grind to a halt because they'd be alt overthinking everything because I'd be scared I was going to kill, kill something, right? Or someone. Um... So I think it really depends on your players, right? Like that totally always depends, of course, you know, on the group. Some groups love it and, and will just bull ahead and see what happens. And some, uh, some are very cautious players, just like in life, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the doom rolls will happen. I'm, it's the FedEx truck right on time. Sorry for the beeps, everybody. It will stop in a second. All right, let's get this highlighted so that we can move uh, on to our stretch break and then uh, move on to our final highlight on all the leather and the wood. There is um, some nice texture here on this staff. Just as far as little, little bits of like carving, like just like striations, almost layers. There's like layers of wood here. It's not just... Uh, straight up there we go and then we've got it's really hard to there you go now you can see it ah uh, yeah just bad rolls I mean bad rolls happen to anybody But I've known GMs who do that, who really go all out for the players. I tend not to enjoy those games, so I like, I, I, you know, you like to play in the kind of game. You like to run the kind of game that you like to play in, in general, I think. So if you tend to like to role play because of the story aspect and building a cool, cool character, you're going to enjoy a DM that wants to help you do that right. And you're not going to enjoy a killer GM. Whereas if you role play because of the challenge of trying to overcome puzzles and monsters and the story and character are secondary to you, you're going to maybe enjoy a killer GM's game because it's going to be full of challenge, tough challenges and a lot of suspense, right? A lot of excitement. So yeah, it's, I don't know. It's role playing is so, so interesting to me because uh, people's preferences are just so different for it. What you're hoping, you have a group of people who are hoping sometimes to get very different things out of the game. And it's just fascinating. It's just really, uh, interesting how as GMs, we try to make everybody to give everybody a little bit of what they want out of the game. Right. It's just really cool. That's why role playing is so neat. One of many reasons, I suppose, including like pizza and beer parties, though I can't have either of those. Any well, I can have a beer every once in a while, but, but you know, I can't have either of those anymore. Uh, but but we did um, all we often have dinner parties around our D&D &D games. So where we 
somebody would cook. Often it was grilling. D&D grilling parties are fun. All right, so we got those highlights on there. We've got, we don't have any wood grain here, so let's pop some, a little bit of it in there. Ah, pregens, yeah. Yeah, maybe because you think it's because it with a campaign, Mist Imp. Um, it's a campaign, right? It's supposed to be long term. So do you think you play more for the long term in a campaign for that reason? But then a one shot is like people don't have so much invested in their characters. And so as a GM, you can take the kit gloves off and see what you can do. See how far you can push it. Yeah, I agree. It, though it's hard, like in that was what I didn't like about um, 3.0 D and D is that it, the tanks were so warrior was so powerful. If you had a a min maxer player building the group's warrior, it was like in order to even threaten that warrior, you risked killing off the entire party, and that's what I, I didn't like a lot about that. Yeah, right. Exactly. Oh, that's very cool. Halloween game. That sounds fun, actually. We really need to find some D&D people out here that we like. That we can play with. Every time I say like this, we, uh, we get another surge in COVID. <laughs> ah, and it puts it off for longer. Dear me. Yeah, that's what I do too at Nomad Zeke. If it's if they're gonna like be grabbing trying to bite whatever's close, then I just randomly roll. But if they're if they're intelligent creatures trying to target, then yeah, then you you've got a different situation, right? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense, Elfin. That's a smart way to move it. Yeah, I just stopped I stopped running three point oh and five. Um, it got, I found that there were just so many, there's such a heavy rules load when you get above a certain, um, level as a GM, I found it very difficult to run those encounters. Just, uh, I like, I like, I tend to like a little lighter weight system where I have a little bit more wiggle room with the rules and, uh, um, that story can be my primary story and action and interesting interesting situations so it was a little bit too rules heavy for me hey Agent Marvel zombie one shot on Halloween that's cool <laughs> that sounds really fun Thormel All right, so we've got our leather like decent, but we could definitely put one more highlight on it and make it look even better. Right now you can see the highlights on it, but it's not like really popping out. So I'm gonna grab, oh, I'm gonna, actually I'm gonna stretch. Yes, yes, I should stretch. And then I'm gonna try to find my leather brown. What, where did you go leather brown? I know you're here. I have oiled leather. Why did I not, grr, where did my 90-30 go? That's very annoying. My 9030 has been eaten by the void. So I'm just going to add some white to uh, oiled leather after this break. Yeah, it's all good. Ah, there we go. Sweet. If you've been sitting around like me, like a lump, um, feel free to stretch. Oh, dear. Oh, whew. Feels good to stretch. Yeah, when I get there. I was thinking about that the other day, Twistoma, because we started to highlight purples and then we, uh, you know, didn't get to 
part of it. The thing about doing streams like this, if you ever try to do streams yourself on mini painting, is that it's very hard when you've got a set time limit to finish out one thing entirely. Um, and so you end up like highlighting all the purple except the purple on the flower, or you end up, you know, highlighting half of the yellow, but not the other half, you know, uh, and then you end up having to go back to it. And for me, um, I'm just like, well, I'll go back to it on a different day a few weeks from now because we might have some different people watching the stream and then they'll get more out of it than you guys who sat and watched me highlight X, Y, or Z before. So I'm going to go do my floor stretch and I'll be right back. Thanks for the cheer, guys. That's pretty cool, Agent Marvel. Yeah, I always think that interesting, interesting encounters and monsters are the way I like to go. All right, so I'm going to do one drop. Oop, I'm going to use a pokey tool, and then I'm going to do one drop of oiled leather. Followed by a drop of bleach linen, which will give us something close to leather brown, which is what I originally wanted. That's okay, Alfin. I mean, we'll have a lot of stuff on sale during the con. Don't worry about it. And you know what? Even if you can't get it right now, Sometimes this stuff hangs around for a little while, so if we uh, don't sell out of it, it may be available for longer than you think. And some stuff will just get put into production after the con, right? Some stuff's just early bird. All right, that is too light, so I'm essentially trying to mix a uh, kind of an orangey. Ah, I might need some yellow in there, though. Well, maybe not. That's really close. I do have pokey tools. Where are my pokey tool? I just put it down. I put it out of the way. I have multiple pokey tools, guys, because me. I have misplaced them. Pokey tool. Ah! And also throwing brushes on the floor. It's that kind of day. Where did you go, brush? And are you a brush I need? Yes, you are. You are a brush I need. <laughs> but do I need a dragon, like a painting big dragon pokey tool? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. Special painting big. Yes, yes. Um, like, like, like my dragon head. It needs to be a dragon head pokey tool. It can be like, um, like a, a, Pewter medallion with the dragon head. Yeah, I'd have to... Pokey tools are such a pain to make, though. Like, Reaper would probably be like, no. <laughs> I'm going to grab a drop of Saddle Brown now, guys, and add this to my faux leather and see how it looks. Yeah, I would really love a dragon head pokey tool. Yeah, a painting big dragon head. I'd have to get the design next time they did a plate if they were going to do any... Uh, a magnesium plate. But I don't know if Reaper really does uh, swag like that anymore, so... Oh, this is a nice color. I like this. I don't think we have this color. This is a... I have mixed a brown that Reaper does not produce. Take note. 
So if you mix leather brown and saddle brown, you actually get a really pretty color. Although I actually mixed oiled leather with uh, bleached linen and then, you know, saddle brown. But it's kind of nice. Yeah, well, that's my, yeah. That's what I'm still hoping for. I'm hoping that Chris, Christina, uh, Christine Van Patten has not forgotten and that Ron has not forgotten the life-size fairy dragon for the next bones. Because I want a desk mascot, dang it. Oh, Proctor rates for a crow's nest pokey tool? Aw. Oh, that sneaky? How did he... That's Proctor, sweet talking the bosses. Now I'm jealous. Super, super duper jealous. We could, we'd have to talk John into it. <laughs> Streamer drama. <laughs> Do you hear that, John? I need a painting big. I need a dragon head pokey tool. It's not fair that Michael Proctor has a crow tool, and I don't have a dragon tool. I'm just lodging my logging my official complaint here. And I'm also trying to do some stippling along the top of this boot. Oh, he had Bob and Julie do it, huh? Hmm. Well, it's a dragon, so I should be able to talk Julie into that. So if I, you're saying if I, if I talk Julie into, into sculpting my uh, draconic uh, pokey tool topper, that then I have a better chance of convincing Reaper to make it? No, they, they knew that we were going to, that John was going to throw them under the bus and then they, they ran away. I'm going to thin this a little bit because I was able to do really fine dots around the top of the boot, but it's a little bit too thick. I think this should be about perfect. This is about four to one, I think. Yeah, you can't ever have enough pokey tools. Exactly. And who wouldn't want a dragon head pokey tool? Now I'll have to talk to Bob and Julie. All right, so I'm gonna take this lighter color and I'm gonna put some scuffs around the toe of the boot. A boot, the boot. Gotta get the, uh, the sole scuffed also. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I lose them too. That's why I've got like three or four. A raccoon head would make a great um, pokey tool topper too. All right, so essentially adding some extra texture here to the toe of the boot is going to make it look, especially if you build it up with a few different layers. So you see how that's lightening, and that's this color. It's a good dust color. And if you build it up with a couple of layers of dots, just stippling, you can make that lighter appearance uh, and that weathered look on the toe of the boot. And then up here, we'll do the same kind of thing for this upper edge of the belt. Now, if you want to, you can try to take this down a bit across the belt in places just suggest a little bit of um, tension cracking. And that can add to the illusion that the belt is worn. I'm trying to make the edges a little bit 
wider with this highlight to suggest that the crack is wider there, which is a, uh, if you go and watch that video that Quindy linked a while ago, you'll probably see me do that if I recall. Yeah. That's the, the you, you have the utilitarian uh, response, Ayanara. You are the practical one. You're just like, I'm just going to buy a bunch of pokey pins. I don't care if they have dragon heads on them. It's much cheaper. I totally do agree on that, but it's cool to have something on them, too. I'm just going to have to ask how I get a crow's nest pokey tool now. But you guys can see, maybe... It's, like, hard to get these stripes to look correct because it's not in scale, right? In reality, if a crack on a belt this big were blown up, that would be a huge crack and the belt would probably be unusable. So I don't like the look, so I think I'm just going to paint over it. Buff it out and just stick with the edges of the leather being a little bit um, worn, which is reading correctly. Haha, -ha, there we go. Puppy paw print, huh? Kiri head? Chibi Kiri head. The Kiri pokey tool. There we go. So see what I mean about the leather's the same color, but if I leave a shadow here and I put a highlight against the top of the bag, you can differentiate, even though they're overlapping. I need a little more highlight here, though. I just want a little bit more there. Well, first you have to be able to get it into mold making and work with their schedule. But if you if you were a sneaky person who hung around, hung around after hours and did it on your own time, you could produce it very quickly. But that would be asking a lot. Oh no, Twistedoma. Pokey tools shouldn't bite. All right, do a little bit more of an extra highlight on the top of the bag here to make sure that the light is falling. That's almost a little bit too much though. It is possible to go too much with your highlights and things suddenly look like they're, they don't have any depth to them because you uh, messed up and, and uh, missed your uh, previous highlight layers. I'm going to add some of this kind of uh, top highlight to this bottom edge of the bag where it would probably be worn. Yeah, the pokey tools themselves take a long time to reproduce because you have to hand set the pins in those molds, right? John, it takes a while. That's why they're expensive. Right, so there's our leather guys, and it's looking pretty good. Um, you can see the kind of the, you know, worn look on the belt. I think I'm gonna blend it in a little bit. Yeah, they are really made by hand. We really have to set those pins in. Like that was the I remember the casters complaining that was the biggest thing they hated about doing pokey tools. It's just that you have to stop and you have to hand set each of those pins in to the mold before you run it. It's just an extra bit of time. And when you're a caster, you are used to being very efficient 
So I'm glazing, guys. I'm glazing with a mixture of uh, this color and a bit of walnut. to Because I decided that that was a little bit too much weathering. So that's knocked it down a little bit on that belt. And I like that. I need to bring in a little bit more... Yeah, they are just pokey tools are just a little bit more so. All right, we are almost there, but we are almost like done with our leather too. Like I think she's actually she holds up. Like I'm looking at her all blown up on that screen, she looks pretty good. Uh Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah when they got acid edged and polished now you could just you know put a, a wash on them and then dull coat them it'd still rub off a little bit but it only rub off on the raised areas so you could get the same effect um what i did uh i actually my recipe that i gave to jim ludwig for dark sword because he he used to do the acid dip and polish but it was such a pain so i told him to just use um a wash of uh gray liner over the top, like a heavy bodied wash over the top of the metal. Works just fine. Is it looking a bit blocky on the big screen? Hey, she's definitely got imperfections and you could totally zoom in like really close and see all the imperfections. Um, but overall, looking at her uh, in my hands here under magnification or I'm magnified up on my screen, um, I definitely think she's turning out really well. Alrighty, so boots, little weathering on the boots, little weathering on there, and I want to highlight the top of the stick. I like this model quite a bit. There are models we're working on that I'm like, eh. There are models that I'm, we're working on that I'm like, yeah. Which is always the case. There we go. A little bit of highlighting there just up at the top where the light would fall on the wood. Oh, Michael's camping. Nice. Yay for getting away from the world, right? I mean, even if it means no crow's nest. I'm looking forward to Reapercon. Although that's that's the opposite of getting away from the world, because then I'm just all in front of all of you. But <laughs> but it is uh, it is more relaxed in some ways. So a little bit of highlighting there to bring out that the details. And maybe a little bit back here as well. Oh, holiday pokey tool, I think, Fendrake. With Lisette, you just had to put a Santa hat on her. Um, I have no idea, Alton. I'm not a not an official like full time Reaper employee. I'm not a paint department employee anymore, so I can't just make these things. Um, so it's up to Sadie whether the department had enough time to make anything special for the con, or if she just didn't want to mess with it. I used to just stay extra, like I would stay late, and I would try to you know find a, a time where where like we had we only had a few minutes left or something and we could just do quick uh, do a quick pump and label on like a half a gallon 
So, but I'm not there anymore to do that, so I have no idea. It is a little bit purpley because we used um, Saddle Brown, and Saddle Brown has some red in it, and it tends to go, it, like its friend Nut Brown, it tends to go a little bit that way. But it's, um, it's partially also that uh, when you add white to Walnut or to Black and Brown, you get kind of a purpley color, and the reason for that is that it's, that dark brown is a, is a red oxide mixed with black, which tends to go slightly purplish when white is added. So it's um, partially kind of a color illusion created by the pigment combination and partially that it looks kind of purpley, especially with purple around it and with the yellow there too. Alrighty. I think we've gotten our, we did a lot of leather. We did leather and wood today. Um, she's getting like closer and closer to done now. That leather was like one of the only things that really, really was outstanding. Now we need to finish the front of the sword um, work on the flowers up here, do touch-ups. Um, there's still like a lot of the silver. We haven't touched the silver yet with highlights, although we did shade it uh, somewhat on the back of the dress. So we've got, we've got some stuff still, but we're uh, getting closer and closer. I whipped out. I'm, I'm starting to separate out, separate out. Do you guys want to keep working on Bones USA? Should we do Darius the Blue next for this one? Like, since we kind of, we kind of created a Bones USA slot. So when, when we're done with Lizette, do you want to go to the next Bones USA? Because I can do that. I have him. Yes, Darius? Cool. Yeah, I like Darius a lot. There's no way I can keep uploading nobody, but that's good because, like, that means that I can pick and choose, right? I can pick and choose the Bones USA models I like. Okay, we'll do that. We'll keep working on Bones USA. I think I've only got two. I think I've got, like, I've got Darius and I've got the Rogue. Uh, I don't have any more Bones USA right now, but, but we can work on that. Maybe I'll use Darius for my, uh... My weathering class at my cloth weathering class at uh, Reapercon. He's got lots of nice, like straight areas of cloth. Yeah. All right. We'll do that. We'll keep this. Uh, we'll keep this slot our Bones USA slot. And when we are done with Lizette, we'll move on to the next. We'll we'll move on to Darius, and then after that, we'll just see what's out there in Bones USA, and we'll just work. And if if Bones USA starts to like be the Bones, then we'll just slowly uh, add a Bones USA slot. But yeah, so cool. Excellent. What we did today is we uh, chose colors uh, for our leather colors and we mostly were working with a little bit of uh, saddle brown mixed with black and brown. Um, we created a mixture of, I did, couldn't find my leather brown 9030, which is normally what I would use. So instead I created a mixture of old leather and bleached linen and added a little saddle brown to it and created a very nice color to use as a highlight for that. Um, so, oh, I haven't looked at the, this month's freebie. Maybe I should place a, maybe I need to go run and place an order. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> so, yes. So that's what we did. We did leather. We did some wood. We talked a little bit about wood grain and scale and also weathering on leather and scale and the considerations. Um, and we did a little bit of weathering on the toe of her boot. And we also like lightened the edges where um, weathering would occur on the leather uh, and did a little bit of extra highlighting up here on top of the staff. You did place an order to get it. Well, I need to place a ReaperCon order for models um, to prep for my class. So definitely. All right, guys, that was fun. And our next model to work on will be back on Bronze Golem tomorrow. So will be Golem Wednesday. I hope you guys have had a great day and have had fun. And thanks again for coming to hang out with me. I always appreciate it. I'll talk to you later. All right. Have a good one, everyone.